Good evening, everybody. Hope you're all well. Good to see you here, nice and timely as ever. And um, as I've said in the past, my name's Craig James, and I'm the president of Bayside Regional Tennis Association. And on behalf of both Bayside and Moorabbin and Districts Junior Tennis Association, we're happy to present uh, this series of webinars to keep you engaged while Melbourne's in lockdown. And we're extremely honoured tonight to have Cara Black with us. Hello, Cara. Hello, Cara. Hi, Craig. Thank you. Thanks Excellent. for having me. And um, oh, sorry, my um, my video has just gone off a bit. Um, but no, thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, welcome everyone. And um, thanks for joining. Yes, Cara's video will come back on and off a bit because unfortunately she's in the process of building a new house and um, so they're just renting a place at the moment so they don't have Wi-Fi connected. So um, sometimes her connection might be a bit dubious but she can see us and talk to us um, but you may not be able to see her the whole time. So let's get started. Um, as usual, I'll just let everybody know that we have the chat function there and I can see quite a few of you logging in and saying hello. Um, great to have you all with us. If you want to ask Cara a question, please type it into the chat function and we will get to you. We might not answer it straight away, but we'll get to all the questions before the end of the session's over. So if you've got some questions, you can put them in there. So let me get started with the presentation for tonight. So what we thought we'd do is introduce you to Cara, tell you a bit about her, and then we'll get into some doubles things that you might be able to applaud. Uh, employ while you're um, practicing and we'll give you some ideas of how you can practice yourself. So just to introduce Cara, um, amongst her achievements, and it is a long list of achievements, 60 WTA titles, five Grand Slam ladies doubles titles, five Grand Slam mixed titles, a career Grand Slam mixed doubles. She got that in 2010 by winning the Australian Open and she's only the third woman in the Open era to complete a career Grand Slam in mixed doubles, the other two being Martina Navratilova and Danielle Hanchikova. She had a career high singles ranking of 31 and won a singles title. Where was the singles title, Cara? That was in Hawaii. Oh, a nice place to win. <laughs> yeah, and I was very relaxed that week, so it just goes to show. <laughs> I hope, hopefully you celebrated, celebrated with a nice luau or something. <laughs> we did, we had a great week. Yep. She also has 11 ITF doubles titles and spent a total of 163 weeks ranked number one in the world. So that's over three years. Uh, it's the number one doubles player in the world. 145 those, of those were consecutive, which is the second longest ever by a woman. And in 2014, it's not that long ago, she was the WTA doubles finals champion. And we'll look at that match a bit as we go on. So... Cara, you were born in Salisbury in Zimbabwe and you're telling me something about this photograph. <laughs> uh, that just brought back so many memories because that um, Peugeot, the white Peugeot you can see, in, in, that was our exact car that we used to have. Um, we had two of those. Um, and my mum, she used to run a daycare centre and she would come and pick us up from school and we'd, there'd be about 30 kids crammed all in that one little Peugeot <laughs> on our way home from school. So it brings back a lot of memories. Was that that probably wouldn't be legal in a lot of places? No, no definitely not legal. Yeah, so it's it's funny to look back and laugh and think what we would get away with. <laughs> yeah, now Zimbabwe is not apart from the Black family, which we'll touch on your family. Zimbabwe is not known as a great tennising nation. Although I think Kevin Ulliott was also from Zimbabwe. Was there much support from the association, or were you on your own a bit? Yeah, you know. Um, Zimbabwe is a third world country, so there, there wasn't a lot of um, support financially, um, unfortunately. And uh, so my dad and my mum financed us through, throughout our careers, especially early on. Um, we were lucky enough to um, get be recognised by the, the International Tennis Federation, the ITF, and they um, would organize a touring team every year to travel overseas. And my brothers were the first to get um, recognized and, and go on these trips and get the exposure and the experience that, that we needed. Because obviously in, in Zimbabwe, we didn't really have a lot of um, competition um, as such. So uh, yeah, my brothers led the way and um, you know, thanks to them, I was um, 
I got recognized pretty early on when I was 13. So um, the next year when I was 14, I got to travel to Europe and spend two months um, over the clay court season going to all the warm-ups to um, the French Open and then playing the French Open juniors, then heading on to Wimbledon in the grass and um, playing uh, Wimbledon juniors. So it was a fantastic experience and something my parents could never have afforded. So, um, you know, other than my, my parents and um, and the ITF, that the was, you know, critical in, in our careers. And um, But, I mean, we did get a lot of moral support from from the tennis Zimbabwe and, um, you know, all, all the backing of, of that but unfortunately you know financially they just weren't able to to help yeah so it's a pretty strong lineage um i believe in your house you had tennis courts in the backyard <laughs> yeah so my dad actually just a little bit of background on on the family my dad grew up on a, a farm in rhodesia and his parents came out from scotland and started farming there and they had a sand tennis court in their in their garden and um they had a wall and my dad just absolutely loved tennis and uh he eventually got on um and traveled he played professionally himself for rhodesia and um back in the days of you know laver rosewell and um all the aussies you know the great aussies they were his his good mates and um and that's how he, and he you know he eventually got to play a few times at wimbledon uh losing in the fourth round twice I think once to um Ashley Cooper and um so he yeah he really absolutely loved it and so it was his dream for to come back to Zimbabwe when he retired and um and build a few grass courts and just make them as impeccable as as the Wimbledon ones and and they really were you know they were his um pride and joy and he and he wanted his kids to to experience what he did and um you know travel the world and and play at Wimbledon one day and um yeah the, the dream and was I certainly to... did you all have, <laughs> yeah you all have a Wimbledon title and yeah did you yeah. ever have any trouble with getting the boys to hit with you or I was that that was the way it was back in those days the whole family uh, I know we have quite a few brothers and sisters that joined into the webinar and I think <laughs> sometimes that's girls tennis us boys don't hit with them is that the case <laughs> Yeah, it was pretty funny because um, my dad initially, because my brothers were older, Barnes 10 years older, Wayne is six years older. He um, initially he would tell me, you know, tennis is not for girls. And um, so my mum kind of brought me up and, and my dad initially was with my brothers. But when they later on would go on to um, university in, in America and um, I was just constantly begging him to, to train me. And um, so what I would do is my mum used to coach little kids as well. So I would help her out on a Saturday morning um, for two hours and she would pay me $30. I remember exactly what it was. And um, I would book a lesson with my dad on that Saturday morning at 11 o'clock. And, um, you know, I'd pay him the $30 that I'd earned that morning. Um, and then when he saw, you know, what I was doing, he, he was pretty, he was, yeah, he was like, okay, she's keen. So he- On he's, those coaching rates, that would have got you what? 15 minutes, 20 minutes? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not even. But um, yeah, it was funny. and. Um, so yeah, pretty much my brothers, yeah, they didn't like really hitting with me. That was more of like a punishment for them. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, they, they were my, um, as I said, they led the pathway for me and um, I was very fortunate to to be the younger one, you know, I think to follow in their footsteps and, and they were my idols, you know, I, I just wanted to do what they were doing and, and I wanted to prove to my dad that I could be better. So there was that. I that think drive you did a good there. Job at it. I think you did pretty well. So, <laughs> at what age did, you, or what stage did you decide that doubles was going to be your thing more so than singles? Um, oh, pretty late in my career. Um, I did start. You know, the thing was, to, I always played singles and doubles. Every single event I entered was always as a junior, from a very young age. Um, and that was always, yeah, it was. I didn't, yeah, I didn't really consider a doubles only career until later on. I think I was about 28, 29 years old. Um, I started, my my doubles ranking was in the top 10 and my singles ranking was kind of sliding a little bit. I was suffering a bit from an ongoing injury um, that was, it was really tough for me to carry on playing singles. So I kind of made the decision then um, to to just go doubles only, which which was tough at the time because, 
you know, I'd done both, but yeah, I think my body was telling me one thing and both my rankings were going in opposite directions. And, um, you know, we were in the doubles, we were making the finals or winning the tournament, you know, every other week. And then I'd miss the qualifying for singles. So it was just this knock on effect of just not getting enough matches. And then my body wasn't holding up. So yeah, it eventually kind of forced me to go, go that way. And, um, I'm so lucky it, it was a great decision, you know, and, and just to, um, for my body and also just, I think I'd, I'd had such a great career singles wise as well, but and then just to, to follow it on and just focus on the doubles was, it, it was easier on one side, I think. Um, on the other hand, you do lose a little bit of your, I think your backcourt game. So, you know, your, your ground shots and that you just, and your, your court coverage, I think you, you you lose that a little bit. So, I mean, I always, you know, any players I work with to play singles and doubles because I, I feel that they both connect, you know, they both can help both sides. So it's just, I think it's it's really good. And doubles, you're getting your all round, you're getting every, you're playing every shot, you know. I think it helps you to be aggressive and you can transfer that to your singles game. And and then vice versa, you know, you bring your singles into your doubles, you're just getting more net play. And um, so it's, yeah, it's something that was, that was, instilled in us to do um and yeah eventually it was just doubles and and it worked really well so the well, timing was great very well and i must point out sue on the chat has pointed out that she also had the pujo 404 as a family wagon so you've won a fan <laughs> in the car stakes now <laughs> what we've got so for everybody that's there this is not going to be cara and i talking about about things backwards and forwards. Now we're going to start showing you some videos. Now, some of this footage is quite old, so it might be a bit grainy. I'm not saying car is old, but the footage was taken <laughs> a, a while ago. Some of it will work. So we'll see how this goes. The first, we've got three different videos we're going to walk work your way through. The first one is specific doubles training that you can do at home and that you can also do during the lockdown. One of them from the Bryan brothers isn't going to work, and we'll let Cara, have a few comments on each video as we go. Some of you may have already seen the first part of th this video, but um, let's play it and we'll stop it at some points and Cara can talk about it. But the first one will go for a minute or two. 100 close, 100 close range volleys off the wall with the stopwatch running. There we go. Harder on the back end, like I think, you know. You feel it more there. 
This drill is called the RDC drill. My dad named it. I'll just come back to you there, Cara, back on the volleys. Um, what pointers do you have now? As you can see, you can use any wall to do that on. What um, pointers do you have for people trying to do that drill? Yeah, I mean, that, that drill, um, when you talk about our success uh, as a family and, and what my, my dad did, um, you know, we would get up every single morning at, at 5.30 before school and we'd practice for an hour. Um, and the, what we'd do is we'd serve for half an hour and then we'd do this drill for 15 minutes where he would time us and we'd see how many volleys we could hit, um, how fast we could hit 100 volleys, basically. And um, I think my record was 39 seconds there. Um, so it definitely, I think that... As you can see later on in the videos there where, where I'm demonstrating in, in the purple, um, I was just working more on technique there. Um, whereas if, when you look back on the videos when I'm going more, it's more about developers and strength in your arm. Um, and you can see I put that extra hand on there to help me go that little bit faster and be stronger with the racket um, when it contacts the ball. And then as you see later on in these other um in this video where I'm demonstrating, it's more, you can work precisely more on your technique there and just working, going back and forth, just focusing on the one side and the forehand, but making sure I think that you're really getting your legs involved, that you're not just standing there straight, you know, straight legged, get the knees bent. So you've got that really good posture and you're um, getting the core involved as well. So you're nice and strong. Um, and you just, yeah, just building that strength in the forearm again. I think that's one. Um, it's such a important key, I think, to build strength in that that part of your arm because you use it so much. And this is one drill that really, really gets it. Um, so yeah, just some different variations. You can go, you know, just the forehand volley, this is the backhand volley. Then you can go one each side. Um, but five minutes of that every day. Um, and as you said, you know, find a wall anywhere you can. Um, yeah, it's such a such a brilliant drill and, and one that has, has um, no doubt made us, you know, given us the, the success we've had for sure. And certainly if you keep your wrist up and locked on that, you'll get a sore wrist after four, after a couple of minutes and, you know, it, it, eventually you keep doing it and it's going to get stronger, <laughs> there's no doubt about that. Yeah, no, the wrist and through the forearm going up, um, no, it really is a great, great strength builder. And um, and then as you go, and then and then you you create the speed, you create how fast you go. You know, the harder you hit it, the faster it comes back. So you can really control that. So, um, you know, you try ten volleys, see if you can do manage that. Then you go, or or you mix up your um, your stance for how far you are from the wall. You know, you can go a little bit closer, or you can go further back just to give you a little bit more time. Um, so yeah, lots of variations there and, um, no, I highly recommend that. That's, um, yeah, one of my favorites. Okay. So the next drill we're going to see is we don't actually have to talk about it. It's the Bryan brothers doing what they call the RDC drill and they'll explain what the RDC drill is. And while they're doing it on a tennis court with a tennis ball, if there is two of you, say a mum and dad and a tennis ball, you could do this on a football oval in a driveway anyway, as long as you're moving side to side. Correct, Cara? Yeah, per, yeah, that's great. You don't, you don't need to be on a court to do up. this. So here we go. No, not at all. Just really go for as long as you can. Just build up this arm. It's even harder on the backhand, like I yeah. think. You, know, you feel it more there. Yeah. The Bryans will come very shortly. Sorry about this. I think this you may have been pregnant in that video. Drill. My dad named it uh, RDC because of the Romanian Davis Cup team used to do this drill. We've been doing this drill forever. It's really good for your volleys. It works on the independence of hands and feet. You're on the service line and you're going opposite ways and you want to touch the alley, move back and forth. It's kind of an advanced drill, um, but we've been doing it. We did it since we were five years old. We still do it today. Um, we could do it pretty good. I mean, on YouTube, there's a, there's a tape where we did over 100. Um, but we want to show you this drill. Um, it helps your lateral movement. You get balls high, you get balls low. And it really helps you to direct the ball to a certain area on the move. Great for poaching, awesome for doubles players. We've used this drill our whole career. And uh, 
It's a crowd pleaser as well. So if you can get this, you know, down with your partner at home, uh, it looks really good during practice. We're the Bryan Brothers. Thanks for checking out the RDC drill. Hope to see you soon. Just focus on Kara's footwork. Watch her footwork during these rallies. So as you'll see, um, that there was a person at the net there, Cara. They really weren't that involved in the rally. Was that to give the illusion of it being specific doubles practice? Yeah, I think, you know, just, just to make it a little bit more realistic and um, for someone just to be a presence there, I think just it, it does help um, just having that visual of that person being at the yep. net. I think obviously when you when you're in a a bubble, you've got moving there all the time. So it just helps you get that little bit of pressure in it. Although it's not being that active, but um, just gives you that visual and creates a little bit more. And, um, and so you work on your respect a little bit more, and you've got a target to aim at. Um, if, yeah, I can see I was just mixing it up, but there's like a can, um, a can that I'm aiming for just to try and get the depth there to keep that person back and trying to work on getting the short ball where our approach and then that first volley, I'm trying to focus on taking it down the line at the net person or down there, um, down the alley there just to, to take the baseliner out of the play. I think um, especially on clay, it's such a, such a good play because you don't want to come in, do all the hard work, get to the net and hit that volley straight back to the baseliner because you're putting yourself in a bit of a vulnerable position. So um, um, now the play, get in and try and stick that volley as well as you can at that net person or just to the to the left of them there, just past them. So, uh, yeah, I do that a lot because that was – I always tried to play – super aggressive and um, get into the net. And as you can see there from my um, my terrible forehand grip, my extreme Western grip, um, <laughs> I didn't want to stay on the baseline too long. I wasn't very effective. So um, the quicker I could get into the net, the better. Yeah. So the next group of videos we've got now, I will apologize for the quality here. These were taken in Rome, but it's yourself and Liesl Huber doing some training. But the thing is, most of this training that they're doing, we obviously need a tennis court to do what Cara just did then. On these videos, you, what there's very little use of the ball. They're really just shadowing here. And um, so we'll play the video and then Cara will come back and tell us a bit more about them. See, there is no use of the ball here, or there's one. Is it true you seem to be working a little bit harder than Lee? more active. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. Oh. What have I done? All right. Are you there, um, Cara? Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. So a couple of questions. Well, firstly, um, oh, uh, yeah, so, start with those sorry, videos. The training without the ball there. Sorry, what was that? Oh, the, that we were just talking about training without the ball for the doubles movements. Okay. Yeah, just um, yeah, that um, that workout there was probably more on um. Are you there? Yep. Yep. Can yep. you? Oh, sorry. Um on footwork and uh, just doing some shadowing yeah you know, as you saw there we would shadow the first ball and then move to and practice more of our sliding on the clay um, probably not Liesl and I's best surface so it was always good to do little things like that and just just keep them short and sharp um, but working on that bit of a slide and um, yeah that explosive movement back and forward for the volley and the smash um, yeah, just just trying to work on those those little areas and try and um, maximize. Yeah, we didn't <laughs> used to get a lot of court time, so whatever you could, you were just trying to slide around all the time and get um, get as used to it as fast as you could. Yep. And now we've got a few questions off the chat. Hayatu was asked, "What is your favorite drill?" Did you have a favorite drill? My favorite drill. Um. Oh, probably, uh, yeah, the volley drill we, you just showed me that I used to do when um, from a very, very young age. That's so probably my favorite. My um, given me the most. Did Did you have a favorite tournament? Did you have a favourite tournament? Oh, Wimbledon, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Not even close. Excellent. All right. So we'll move on to another video now. Now we're going to look specifically at some doubles tactics that we can we can use. Well, not we, but the players can use. Oops, I haven't started playing the video. Sorry, I'll just come back. So the first thing we notice is both of you are on the baseline there. Stunning from Cara Black. And the number eight seeds are in the final. So the three things to look for here, you're both on the baseline, a chip return, and then a top spin lob winner. So here's the same video again. <laughs> So that was on a match point for the China Open. Um, tell us about that. We're going to see quite a few options. Did you often go both on the baseline? Oh, just sometimes just to mix it up. It wasn't always the case. It was probably more when I, I was returning. I'd stay on the baseline. And yeah. And I noticed, um, yeah, and you used the chip return. Return more of chip or long cross. So I'm quite the my. Carrie, your sound uh, breaking up a bit. You might want to turn you know, off. 
just turn off your camera, Cara. Oh, you've okay. So we've temporarily lost Cara. She's coming back on now. She's logging back in. No, we've lost her again. She'll be back. We'll continue. She'll log back in, and we're going to continue with the next video. Um, and this is this time they're in the I formation, and once again it's a chip return and approach, and both receivers are on the baseline. But look at the first movement of the net player during this. So did you see that first movement of the net player into the middle of the court? There we go. Well, that's such a smart read. Terrible. And you'll see on that one black. that Kara uh, directed her volley straight at the right shoulder. That's the hardest place to hit a volley from, at the right shoulder of the other player. That's why she does that wall drill that we just saw. Yeah. And now we're going to see the communication. So after every point here, Kara is going to go back and talk to her partner, whether they've had a good point or not. So you want Kara running back to find out what's going to happen in the next point. Cara, are you back with us? No, still not there. That's all right. Isaac 15, 30, 15. Why don't you, why, why? Back again to talk about what's going to happen on the next point. Cara, are you back with us? No, Cara's still not there. We'll keep going. All right. So it looks as though Cara is having some trouble. As I said, they don't have a Wi-Fi connection there. Hopefully, she'll come back and join us shortly. Now, Cara, I said at the start, made the 214. Uh, WTA finals in Singapore with Sanya Mirza. This is the introduction to them making that final, and then we'll have a look at some of the points in particular from the final. I think as a um, tennis player, you always dream of you know having a very consistent year and making it to the WTA finals. I'm excited to play with Kara, um, who's won this a couple of times before, won this event, also trying to win. I think for us as players, you know, it's our goal throughout the year to, to make the finals and that's definitely a, a big goal on our list all year, so um, to make it is, is amazing. I am Sanya Mirza. I'm so happy to have qualified for the WTA finals. See you in Singapore. See you in Singapore. Ah, Kara, welcome back. Uh, she's been devastating when moving backwards. Terrific footwork from Black. Hello, Kara. Hi, sorry, my internet is so bad. That's all right. We just um, looked at a few other points and um, the communication side of the tennis, particularly. Uh, going back and talking to your partner to find out what happens um, in each point. What would you talk about when you go back and talk to your partner? Say you're the serving pair and you, you're at the net and you go back and talk to your partner after before each point. Cara? Okay, sounds as though Cara is still having some problems there. We'll, we'll continue on. So that point in particular that we just saw um, involved um, watch for the um, chip lob to act to counteract the I formation. So Kara is returning the ball. 
the opposition are in the I formation. So she um, chips the ball back over the head to get herself in an attacking position and then look at her footwork to get back and hit the smash. So chip lob in the from the I formation into the net. And the footwork to get back. Uh, she's been devastating when moving backwards. Terrific footwork from Black. Once again, look, look at Kara in the black, trying to get involved in the point. That's great stuff and great reactions and footwork by Black to not be thrown off as the ball trickled over the net and then went at a very odd angle. If you're not low to the net, um, ready to move, you will not pick up a ball that hits the top of the net. So we'll watch that point again. Watch Kara's trying to get involved, faking through the middle each time. Ball hits the top of the net, short angle across. They're back in the point, That's and they win the stop. point. And great reactions and footwork by Black to not be thrown off as the ball trickled over the net and then went at a very odd angle. Now this next one is a set point. This is an option to go straight at the player. And Again, as we and said before, that right ball went straight to the right to the shoulder. Back of the court. In this one, she's trying, Kara's trying to get involved in the point. Look, she's trying to get across, trying to help out Sanya, trying to get across, and then on her toes again. Oh, yeah. And smashes Isn't the ball away. Black hit her overheads. And now match point. Once again, lob return into the net, follow it back. And the chance to cross straight down the middle. And look at the scoreline, 6-1, 6 love for a WTA title. Some good play in doubles match. Teamwork personified in the form of Cara Black, Sonia Mirza, as they unseat the defending champions and do so in dramatic and overwhelming fashion. Okay, so Cara, have you been able to rejoin us? We had you back for a short while there. Uh, it looks as though Kara's, um, we've lost Kara again. Let's see if there's any chat questions. Uh, we've talked about the favourite drill and we know her favourite tournament. So we've got a third video here that we can show. And this one is going to look at a few other, other things. Uh, let me just find out. First thing is we're going to look at that chip return again. And with volleys, they don't always have to go Deep. You watch this first point. This is from Madrid. They use a short angled volley. Chip return, follow it in. Oh, well, it was oh, actually, a that wasn't the chip return. The next one is the short angle volley. Well. There you go, the short angle volley. Now, one other thing to look at at this point, we'll just replay that again. We've got oh, well, coming up again. This would not be possible if they hadn't talked about this point beforehand because Kara crosses, but Sanya has already gone across. So we're talking about communication. There's the communication Did right well. there. And they win the volley by hitting the short, like short volley. Well, nothing wrong with Peng's volleys there, but Mer's... All right, this is a pretty incredible um, point from Wimbledon last year. Kara is playing with Martina Navratil over here. Left-handed backhand. <laughs> this one's just a bit of fun to look at. They actually won Wimbledon last year in the um, Invitational Doubles.
to be one of the best points of the whole tournament. Martina on the ground. Carla Black hitting the left-handed backhand. 15 0. <laughs> Martina says, Do we get one point for that? <laughs> the secret is here. If you keep making your opponents make another shot, on the ground, you're always still in the chance to win the point. The end of that point. To applaud it. Now, this next one, after a point like that, yep, yeah, I've just got a message from um, Kara. She's struggling to do it. So I'm going to get her back on the phone. So just bear with me, everybody. I will just call up Kara. We'll get her back here. Sorry about this. Won't be a moment. I'll be back with you in a moment. So there you can hear my phone ringing and Cara will come back to us. Hi, Craig. Hi, Cara. Yep, we're here. I'm pretty sure everybody can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you and I think everybody else can hear you. What we're doing, we've just played a few videos of the WTA. I'll finish the videos we've got then we'll come back and have a chat to you. How's that sound? Yeah, perfect. All right. All right. So this next video is just once again, keeping yourself in the point. Watch that volley. Point to applaud it. Let's watch that point again. Watch the volley that the player makes when they've given up on the point. It just shows you can always stay in a point. Unfortunately, I think Cara is on the losing end of that point, but she's been on the winning end of most of them. <laughs> this was the behind the back volley at Wimbledon, Cara. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh, yeah. yeah. At... Luckily, we went on to win that match. So <laughs> never would have... Yeah, would have hold on for that. Yep. Now, this video is basically for the girls out there that play mixed doubles to encourage you don't be intimidated by the men. Now, I know it's Serena, but just watch the way she takes them on here. So, never be intimidating mixed doubles. And once again, now we're going to look at Leander and Cara playing at Wimbledon. And look at where Cara is standing to serve. She'll be way out near the tram line. First of all, there's the communication with Leander. They're talking about it. And now looking at the serving position. And we'll get Cara to explain. You're out pretty wide there, Cara. Yes, that's right. You're serving. And um, yeah, with Leander. And you're not quite in the alley, but you're right on, on the edge of it almost. Am I serving wide? Yes, yes, yeah, serving on the forehand and backhand side. And Leander is almost in the eye formation. Yeah, yeah. Tennis so channel presents hold serve. Bag Check. Now we're going your to your look bag at all the check. gear the players are carrying we around. We don't have to talk to Today on Bag Check, Cara Black. Hi, I'm Cara Black, and this is my bag check. Only got four rackets in here at the moment. I've got two favourite rackets, Mark 1 and 2. <laughs> it's probably just a superstitious thing. My Oakley sunglass case, empty. They're in there somewhere. Sun cream, growing up in Africa, you always needed that in your bag. Power bar. A vanilla crisp is probably my favourite flavour. I don't know where those glasses have got to. I love playing soccer. I grew up with two brothers. That's all we did, actually, growing up. There they are. This is my beanie, Signal Snowboards. One of my my favorite snowboarding company. I love to snowboard. Extra bits of clothing, perfume, not smelling too good at the moment. I think that's about it. What a mess. You caught me on a bad day. <laughs> I'm Cara Black and that was my bag check. This has been Bag Check. Get even more bag checks online at tennischannel.com. All right, so that was the last little bit was just to embarrass you a bit, Cara, I think. <laughs> <laughs> bringing back memories obviously you had a snowboard um sponsor <laughs> yeah i was actually um i invested in that company yeah so i was trying to get some free advertising um. <laughs> did it work 
<laughs> no, not really. <laughs> and of course, the whole time your glasses were actually on the top of your head that you were looking for them. <laughs> yeah. uh, the camera always makes me nervous. Okay. Now we're looking at a slide right now uh, entitled The Case for the Eye Formation. Would you like to talk a little bit about the eye formation? Um, yeah, I, I really love um, this play, um, this specific play, uh, just, yeah, for quite a few reasons. Uh, the first one being, I think, when you're playing a really strong um, returning team um, and they're quite grooved in their returns in that specific spot going cross court, uh, it's just good to try and mix it up and, and get in their heads a little bit just to make the court um, look a little different and just keep them guessing as to which way you're moving and which way the the server's um, going to move as well. Uh, but I think, yeah, it's um, just to, as I said, mix it up and, and, and get in their heads. And it's also, it's also um, used for not the strongest servers, you know, some like, and that was especially me, like, not being that tall, I didn't have the biggest of serves. So um, often my poor partners were getting um, drummed at the net off my my very weak serves. So um, so it was just a good a good way, um, as you pointed out there earlier, like with Leander where he was standing. We weren't quite in eye formation there, but um, it was just you know you can throw in all these different plays, different stances where you're going just to keep the opponent guessing. And um, just to take them out of their comfort zone and make the court feel smaller, and um, as it trying and and the object of it too is for the the net person to to get the ball. You know, um, ultimately that's your goal. You want the net person to be able to get there and finish off the point. So um, that was a play we did, we did a lot, um, especially in mixed, um, because Leander he was and and my brother who I played a lot of mixed doubles with too um, were phenomenal movers at the net. And um, as I said, off my weak serves, they could pick off anything, you know. So I was very fortunate to have, have them up net, at net while I was serving. <laughs> um, if you're a returner and the serving um, people are playing that, what is a couple of returns as a returner options you've got? I guess the chip lob? Yeah, actually, it's a great question because when I formation was being played on me um, and, and now coaching and, and everything, um, and what I try to teach my players is for, for me the hardest return to cover to cover is the one when um you hit the return down the line so that net person that's where they have to because there's always one little spot on the court that you both of you can't absolutely cover the whole court so there's always that one little area that you can go for and for me when you're doing eye formation um and they serve to you there that's the spot to go line um because i feel and for the net person, there's no way they can get, they can cover, they can cover probably up to about two feet away from the, the first tram line. So um, if you hit a good solid return, just even in that first first tram line, I think you're looking pretty good to to win the point. But obviously, you know, it, d it depends on what kind of serve you're receiving. Um, but the chip lob is also a great option. Um, and that's why also with the eye formation, it's it's good to mix up where you stand a little bit. Um, as as I was saying, for me, when I would be at the net when I was doing eye formation and my partner was serving, um, I would I would stand a little bit more on the to to the right. So it's a little bit difficult to explain. So if my partner was serving on the ad side, I would stand on the ad side, like one foot away from from the centre line, uh, just to give myself um, the best chance to cover that line return because that's the hardest one to cover. And I think when you're coming out of that position in the eye, you, the thing you need to remember and to be most effective at the net, you need to move in a diagonal um, position, whether you're going for a forehand volley or a backhand volley. So making sure you're not uh, moving parallel, um, but you're going straight in that like a v um so you can cut off the angle a little bit more and be that much closer to the net and catch the ball at a higher you know above the net which makes for an easier volley and you get a better direction on where to where to hit the ball yeah I, that's a very good point too i actually had a had videos but i missed to point that out that as actually the one that did it was the rome training when 
uh, Liesl and yourself were shadowing your forehand and backhand volleys. The picture was side on, but you could actually see that you were heading towards the net. Everything was done diagonally, even when you were practicing without the ball. It was, certainly wasn't a straight parallel to the net move. It was an it, it was a forward move as well as going across. That's it. Yeah. So per, yeah, not only on the eye formation, but when just in general normal poaching, yeah, you really want to move in that diagonal that you're going, and you call it the close and cross. So it's not just a cross. You have to close and then cross. So move, yeah, towards the net because, like I said, then it helps you to be, um, yeah, catch that ball before it gets below the net, which makes for a really difficult volley. And um, as long as you're staying, yeah, as low as you can, and and working in that diagonal movement. Yeah. If anybody listening wants to contact me and see what we mean on a video, I can give you the link to that Rome training video and you can have a look. And if you just watch Cara and Lisa when they're practicing without the ball, they're actually going diagonal. They're certainly not going parallel to the net. A few other areas, obviously, that we can do. Um, we've only got about nine minutes left, so we're going to run out of time to get through all of these. But um, the fake at the net, I tried to point out on a few of the videos, you're always active in the net, moving your shoulders towards the centre, trying to, I guess, in a way, pretend and give the receivers or the people at the other end so they didn't know which way you were going to cover. Absolutely. Oh, the poach is such an important manoeuvre, um, you know, and something... I'm sorry, not the poach, the um, fake. Um, such an important thing um, because your job at the net as an... Um, the net player is to to distract the returner or the baseline or your opponents. Um, you want them to take their eye off the ball. You want to keep them guessing all the time. So if you're not crossing, you're faking. You know, if you're not, yeah. So just keeping that um, constant, keeping them guessing all the time. You know, what is she going to do? Or sometimes you fake and you cover the lob, or you you fake and you you're watching your line. And um, and that was something that Lisa, you know. A lot of my partners, like Liesl and Sonia, they were more baseliners. So we would have certain plays where I'd say, okay, I'm going to fake this time and I'm going to cover the lob and try it. Because because I was so close and so active on the net, I did get lobbed a lot. But um, we wanted to try and keep keep that aggressive style of play. So we always thought it was important for me to try and take that ball as a smash and take it out the air just to, to keep that aggressive play. Um, and other times, yeah, it was like, okay, I'm, I'm crossing and you've got the lob. Or, uh, so it's just so important to constantly have that communication and um, have a plan for every point. You know, that was something that really helped me a lot. Um, some players a little bit more um, instinctive and, and would, you know, they wouldn't maybe just they would discuss with their partner where they were serving, but they wouldn't say whether they were going or they would just move on instinct. But um, for me, I prefer to have those planned plays, and um, especially, as I said, when my partners would stay on the baseline. Yeah. Now, here's an interesting one. Don't play offense on defense. So when you're defending, hit a good shot, not a great shot. Oh, sorry, Craig, you cut off. What was that? Oh, don't play offense on the defense so when you're defensive how should you get yourself back into the point um yeah i think in doubles i mean the one thing i would do is go to the lob a lot um as i mentioned before like my my ground strokes weren't weren't the best so when i when i got caught on the baseline and i was pushed back um a lot of times i would just try and hit a high ball back over the, the net person or lob cross court so I could try and run in as fast as I can and get to a more of an offensive position. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it depends. For me, that worked, but I guess it just depends on your... Yeah, particularly. Yeah, what your strengths are and, um, and your weaknesses, I guess. Yeah. And speaking of weaknesses, obviously a big strength in doubles, you're playing two people. Um I'm sure you knew about it on the tour, hitting towards weaknesses. Now, it might not be the weaker player, but it might be a weaker shot. Yeah, definitely. You know, um, we would definitely try and um, pick on, yeah, at certain times the weaker player or the weaker side of a certain player. Um, or, or, you know, um, some girls aren't so comfortable at the net, so that's why I was saying that 
I would always practice that drill of me on the baseline, returning and coming in and hitting that first ball um, at the net person, you know, because I feel like that was putting them out of their comfort zone. Um, and bringing them into my world a little bit. Um, so yeah, that was that's one thing I definitely um, would always, yeah, that, that for me was always a weakness I felt was my strength. And I felt like once I was at the net and in a volley volley situation, I would back myself. Um, so that was one play I would always try and play to my strengths. Yeah, while we lost you there for a minute, I did mention that one of the most vulnerable spots for a player is the right shoulder. Did you make a conscious effort to direct balls to people's right shoulders? <laughs> yeah, no, definitely right shoulder, right hip. Um, that's, yeah, definitely a very, um, very tricky spot. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, especially for girls sometimes on the on the backhand side, um, like we would play, um, I was trying to think of an example, someone like a, um, actually, uh, so I'm trying to think. But well, we did a, yeah. see a very good one from you at the on set point of the WTA finals in Singapore, right through Ping at the net. That was the, for the first set, and that was right at her right shoulder. Yeah, absolutely. And that was one, you know, there's a, sorry, that's a perfect example, Peng. She was very scared at the net, you know, and um, Sonia had extremely penetrating returns or, you know, off the ground she was, she was, it was quite intimidating. So actually what they would do, that team, um, Peng, when Su Wei was serving, um, talking about weak serves and that, she she didn't have the fastest serve, and um, so her second serve would really sit there, and Sonia would just, you know, eat that for breakfast and absolutely ping that ball at, at Peng. And um, so eventually, Peng, when when Su Wei served, she would stand on the baseline with Su Wei um, because she was just completely terrified at the net. So, um, so yeah, that was diff. but you know, she was, she was extremely dangerous on the baseline. So there we were, um, you know, they a very smart play on, on their part to, to bring her back and, um, you know, put her back in her comfort zone. And then as soon as Sue Wei had an opportunity, she would get to the net. And then, so it was just a battle of, yeah, who could get to their strengths first. Yeah. Well, you obviously played them a number of times and had a lot of close matches just that that WTA final wasn't one of them. Six, one, six love. That would have felt good. <laughs> Yeah, no, that was incredible. I really enjoyed that match. Um, there was no way we should have been in the final either because the the first round and the semi final we were down match points um, in oh. in both those matches. So it was it was kind of like, oh, we're happy to be here and we're going to go out and just enjoy this. And um, yeah, we really did. We played one of the the best matches we played together. Yep. Now the we'll look at our one last point. Then if people would like to tap their questions into the chat. We'll give you a quick minute to put some questions in while we talk about the importance of getting your first serve in in doubles. Yeah, um, oh, so key. You know, as I said before, um, just having a second serve, it's so vital to put as much pressure as you can on that and um, uh, get in, follow it in behind you know, get into the net behind it if you can. Um, but just, and also if you if you are struggling with it, you know, sometimes just, just take a little bit of pace off the serve and just maybe go for a more of a 75%, 80% serve just to, um, I think, yeah, just to create, keep that return off the baseline a little bit um, because I think, you know, the, and changes the mindset because, you know, I think your whole mindset changes when you're receiving a first serve or a second serve. So um, I think, yeah, anything it takes to, yeah, just try and try and um, work on a bit more percentage there rather than um, going for too many bombs and, and keeping it low, low percentage. Um, and as we said before, mix in the eye formation too, you know, 75% kick out wide and, um, you know, move to the right, let your partner take the middle. Um, just yeah, just trying to um, keep those percentages up and not not give them t too many looks on second serves for sure. Okay, so have we got any questions? And if there's no questions, we'll wrap it up now. Um, I'll give everybody a minute to type in some questions if you've got one. No, it looks as though everybody's happy now. So thank you so much, Cara. We know there was no, a few pleasure. technical difficulties, yeah, but I think sorry we, about that. Oh, we absolutely got there in the end, not to worry. Um, the, the phone system seems to have worked well. Everybody's stuck with us. So 
that's a good sign. We'll see everybody at one o'clock uh, tomorrow for lunchtime fitness and then again on Sunday for fitness with Georgia. Cara, you have a great week. You can go and look after the, the kids and Brett now. And <laughs> no, thanks, <laughs> we'll let Greg. You go. No, and, um, yeah, hats off to you and, and your team and um, everything, you know, for you guys, what you're doing. Um, for the whole tennis community here in Victoria, I think it's, it's outstanding, you know, trying to keep everyone together and um, keeping that connection. It's, um, it's fantastic. So, yeah. Well done to you and, and thanks for everyone for joining in and listening and um, hope it was beneficial. Thanks, Cara. It was great. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Thank thanks, you. Dave. Bye.